Hi everybody, it's Jennifer from the Channel Federator Network here again. Um, as most of you know, I am uh, the MCN manager, so I make sure I bring people onto the network and then I make sure that you guys are doing really well, you're growing, and I organize stuff like this, like live streams and hangouts and events and all that stuff. So that in mind, um, let's talk about our current live stream with our special guest, Zach. Um, as you may or may not know, I hope you guys do know, but Zach is completely talented all around. He produces short films, web comics. He uh, is currently working on a children's book, which is really going amazingly well. Um, his web comic is Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, and uh, he also has a super successful Patreon account, a Kickstarter that is just amazing. I don't think he can keep up with all the stretch goals coming out. Um, and then he also has a festival that we're going to talk about a little bit and a, uh, what do you call it, a pay-per-view uh, or not really pay-per-view, but your, your sh short film series, Star Starpocalypse, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm just going to remind everyone in the network that this live stream is a good three to four minutes behind. So if you ask a question and we don't answer it right away, it's probably because uh, we didn't see it yet. So give us, well, actually, you guys are behind us. So just give it a minute for us to answer those questions. And totally ask, I, I talked to Zach beforehand, and he totally said he was open for anything. So go ahead, give him your worst, ask him anything you'd like. Um, and you can submit it right in the little um, questions on the sidebar there, and we will answer them one by one for you guys. So, um, yeah, let's get started. So, welcome, Zach. Uh, why don't we talk about, like, what started it all for you? Like, did you just start Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, or was there a step before that? Uh, I, I started it really in something like, in, in high school, like in the late 90s, but um, as a career that pays for itself, more or less, I've been doing it since, I think, 2007. Um, the main reason I switched from a hobby to a career is because I was working in entertainment and I hated it with a uh, an undying loathing and uh, and comics was sort of a way to get a paycheck without having to deal with Hollywood people. Well, what what were you working in the entertainment? Like, what were you doing? I, I did a lot of different stuff, but the, the last job I worked... Um, actually, the, the, it's funny, the job people think is amusing now is I worked for the Asylum for a while, which before it was the company that made Sharknado mm -hmm. um, back when it was... Uh, Trying to do serious horror, um, and uh, but the last job I worked was for talent agents who are, except for mine, are 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 just evil monsters uh, who should be done away with, um, maybe shot into the sun. I don't know. Oh, okay. But uh, but uh, I, I it was it was the most miserable job I've ever worked in my life, and it was in a way though it was good because it convinced me that I didn't want to work in um, in that field anymore. So I figured I'd uh, I. Uh, if I maybe if I could just uh, do comics every day, uh, I could escape. Um, and I think about maybe a year after I decided to do that, uh, I was able to just barely like I you know could eat lentils for uh, lunch every day, but I could do it. So how did how did you start that process? So like you hate your job, you want to yes. quit, you want to make you want to just make comics for a living. How did you even start to like? Well, this is what I'm going to have to do in order to get paid in order to survive just on lentils. And now you're doing more than just surviving on lentils, I hope, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sub substantially better. I should probably eat more lentils, but... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, well, uh, I, I hesitate to, to answer just because um, it's probably terrible advice because I think I've just made continual mistakes. But maybe that's good if you get your mistakes out of the way, you get into doing it right. Um, not that I'm sure I'm doing that now, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I just figured, for, for in my case, whenever I had in the past, I just kind of sp sporadically updated my website, and whenever I had actually bothered to update every day for, say, a few months at a time, I'd always gotten a pretty good audience out of it. So I figured just sort of progressing the trend, if it had held, I, I, sh I should be able to pick up enough audience, and that ended up being more or less true. Um, uh, the, the stupid thing that I advise people again, and it's, and it's, it's probably just the way you think of you're a real dork, because I found out my brother had the same problem when he was doing business stuff, which is we both made the assumption that the, the way 
I like to say it is that the system is equilibrated. That is to say, you do content, and ipso facto, you get a certain amount of money. It turns out you actually have to run a business uh, in order to get paid. Um, so uh, so um, for, for nerds, it's this weird trap. I feel like a person who knew less math wouldn't have fallen for it, but you have this idea that automatically there shouldn't be this gap between the quality of your work and the amount of money you get paid, but you know, just switching an ad network can, can really uh, change things. Yeah, that's one thing that I find uh, a lot of the creators in the network have struggled with before, is that mm -hmm. they're amazing, they're super creative, they come out with amazing stuff, but then as far as like promoting themselves and looking at it from a business perspective, it's it's really hard because you, especially a lot of you are going solo on these things, and it's and you have to be both the businessman and the creative genius behind it, and and it's really difficult for a lot of people. But once you get that down, and once you realize like, oh, I have to be an advocate for myself, and I have yeah. to promote my my content and try to find new audiences, then things work out for the long run. And and it's really interesting that you say like you were doing it every day, right? Yep, every day. And, yeah, every day, and that's that's consistency. Consistency yep. is so big nowadays, and like YouTube yep. especially, they're, they're, we have word that you know they might be changing their algorithm soon again, and they're going to they're going to more feature people who bring daily traffic to YouTube, who bring mm -hmm. weekly traffic to YouTube, like things that so uploading consistently is going to win over great content, especially on YouTube. I mean, like, having great content is the bonus, but if, if you're making an amazing short, and but you're only uploading, like, once a month, the person who's making, like, okay shorts, but uploading daily is going to win out over you. Yeah. Um, and do you find that, too, with the with the online web webcomic world? Uh, you know, the, I think it, uh, um, it depends on what you're doing to an extent. I, I do think... It, it, it depends on what the question is. If the question is what will make you the most money, it probably is very regular updates. I don't know. It, it's weird because there are a lot of exceptions. You know, like there's the oatmeal and he updates once every two weeks to a month on an irregular schedule. He does great. But um, my suspicion is you can only get away with that for certain types of content. Like his content or like hyperbole and a half was kind of the same thing. They're big updates and they're, I won't say topical, but they're sort of, Observational. There's stuff people can relate to. They're not necessarily like <laughs> crazy, stupid jokes. Um, and so uh, um, there are exceptions. It might, it might not work the same on YouTube. I, don't, I know less about YouTube, but um, but I, I suspect in terms of making money, and and I also I want to say in terms of creative freedom, there are some advantages to uh, regular updates um, because if you you can try something out um, if you update every day and it can stink and you can uh, sweep it away. Uh, more or less, uh, which which yeah, you can't do. That one. Month. Yeah, yeah. Well, that never happened. Um, <laughs> Next so, one, move on. Yeah, exactly. But I, th I think the way I want to say it is, some people have managed to defy the regular update thing, but they are usually exceptional. They're um, they're the outliers of it. Yeah, they're outliers. Uh, so right, and I mean, there are always exceptions to everything all the right. time. Yeah. Um, so what what's your inspiration for your, like, how hard is it to come out with a new co comic every day? Like, how do you keep the inspirational creative juices flowing? It's, uh, I, I have, I used to be really bad at it, actually. Uh, I, I used to um, uh, get what, what's called writer's block, but I don't like the term too much. But what, what I do now is um, I read a lot. I, 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 if I'm behaving, which I try to behave, uh, I... Um, read something like three to five books a week, and I try to read difficult books, um, like you know, math books, but also maybe history I'm unfamiliar with, or philosophical books, this sort of thing. Um, and I actually find anytime I'm having trouble writing, it's, I can almost always look back and find that I haven't been keeping up with my reading schedule. Um, so it's really not that hard if you're reading a lot, because you have a lot of stuff going on in your head. Um, so my my my, my motto, my, my uh, quick version of my advice is you should be an extremely boring person if you want to work in entertainment. You should you should sit with your nose in a book and you should uh, not go out with your friends and you should have no social life and uh, and you'll be fine. Well, just drawing inspiration creatively from other sources, right? Yeah. When, and on that note, too, I don't, um, I feel bad saying this, but I hardly read any comics uh, these days because specifically, I mean, partially I... I feel bad saying this, but it's just comics really aren't my thing. I enjoy making them, but I'm not. I'm just not a big comics reader. 
Um, That's so funny. Uh, I do have, you know, I, I, I have comics writers I love, but very few. Um, but uh, I, I also, on principle, I, I think you ought to read outside your field, because um, otherwise you're liable to inadvertently, or maybe on purpose, uh, be just copying whatever's popular right now, um, which uh, which might actually work in the short term business wise. But I think you know, if, if you're in this as a career, you should not consider the short term very often. Right. Exactly. Um, so when was there a point where, because like Patreon's new, right? And yeah. you are currently, I think I just looked it up, per month Patreon is giving out, or you have patrons, they call it, of like $8,480 per month or something insane mm -hmm. like that. Like how did you uh, go about asking people like, hey, support me, and like did you already have a giant following and community for that and they were just willing to absolutely let's do this or where is it more like please support me so I can do this and why um, you know how did that how did patreon start for you um, I think it was in, in my case it was mostly pre-existing community we haven't we haven't pushed it too hard um, because um, uh, I, I just don't want to uh, unlike most of the stuff we do patreon is really pure goodwill like we, we do have little rewards, but they're not commensurate with the amount of money people are paying. Uh, I mean, and that's and we're upfront about that. This is purely you would like to support what I do um, or what I and my team do, and uh, and and so you're you're paying money into that. Uh, so I for that reason I try not to be too naggy about it. Um, as opposed to the Kickstarter, where I, I I'm a bit more uh, insistent about it, but everything except for the stuff at the ultra premium levels is priced at retail. So um, it's basically, you know, this is the month we're launching a new book, so it would be really nice if you would buy it, but we're not, we're not asking you to do us a favor, let's say. Um, so I haven't been too pushy with it. Um, the, the people that have come, I suspect, are mostly just long-term um, readers. Uh, and and I, part of why I was excited is because before we did it, I fairly regularly would get people saying, look, I don't want to buy any of your merchandise, but I would like to support you. Um, I just don't want... I don't want any of the stuff you're offering, oh. um, which is, you know, I, I totally understand, you know, I mean, for any given item, we sell them less than 1% of our audience, um, so uh, before then, I would just, I didn't know what to say to them, and now we say, well, you know, chip in a buck a month, uh, and you'll be doing more than your share. It's also good for us in particular because, um, but probably lots of other people too, is Adblock is just killing ad revenue, um, and I, I'm sort of torn because as a seller uh, and a person who likes money, um, and I should say, especially as a person who now having a kid uh, really likes money, um, I I don't like that I'm just losing ad revenue to people using AdBlock, but I, I do support the idea that consumers should have the ability to consume content how they like within reason. Um, so to me, it, uh, explicitly, Patreon is a way to get off ads entirely, um, but without lowering the amount of revenue the company makes. Um, so, so, but it's nice because it's also sort of a selling point. Um, like I was once at a convention, it was a really good fan experience where I, um, a guy came up to me and said, "Hey, I use AdBlock. Here's five dollars." And I was like, "Great, that's that's probably more than you will ever cost me by using AdBlock as an individual." Um, so Patreon, I view it kind of like that. It's like if you want to use AdBlock but you feel a little bad about it, uh, you know, chip in a dollar a month and you're more than offsetting the, the loss in revenue. Well, like, that's funny because I was just, we were just at VidCon and there was a panel about, like, crowdfunding. And a lot of the questions from the people in the audience were like, well, how do I, how am I, you know, ask for money without being a douche about it? Yep. And and a lot of people were saying that, like, honestly, your audience wants to pay you. Like, it's not as awkward as you think it is. Like, they want to support you. They want to give you the money. You just yep. need to give them the resources to do it. Yeah, um, yeah, and you're saying exactly the same thing that everyone else is saying is like they literally want to give you money. Like they might not want to buy your stuff, but they want to support you in whatever the way they can. So they, in turn, get more content. So they really are winning in the long run. Um, just, just out of curiosity, what kind of merchandise uh, does does better than others? Uh, better is a, a loaded term or an unloaded term because I don't know. In terms of money. It's probably shirts, which sucks because they're the hardest merch to deal with. Um, because you have to list, I think we list 12 sizes for every shirt, you know, because you have. 12 sizes? Well, because you have uh, small through triple X, male and female cut. Oh, um, okay. And so you, I think it's 12 sizes. Um, I think it might be 13 now. We just started listing 
Um, triple X, we don't carry too many of them, but they do sell, it turns out. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's, it's a pain in the... Uh, I don't know if I can swear on the show. It's a pain in the... I already the, swore, so you're fine. Okay, it's a pain in the ass. Um, yeah. <laughs> total pain in the ass. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't even say that because I'm not the one who runs shipping, but I remember it being a pain in the ass when I had to do it because um, you have to stock, and you don't know. You come out with a new shirt, and you use your usual ratio, and then for whatever reason, a lot of small people are buying it, and then you're out of small, you know. Uh, whereas a book, you just have stacks of books. It's real simple. Same with posters. Um, so in terms of overall consistent revenue, people buy T-shirts. The other crappy thing about T-shirts is they cost a lot of money up front. Uh, it's not that bad for us now that we have a nice cash flow, but to do, say, a run of 200 shirts should cost you uh, something like 1500 bucks, which is a pretty big outlay if you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. um, or that is, I mean, we, we, we spend a lot on quality. You can do a cheaper shirt, but, I, you know, I, I end up wearing a lot of the ones that don't sell, so I'd like them to be uh, reasonably <laughs> like comfortable. Um, uh, yeah, but in terms of profit per unit, like a really good poster is awesome because uh, they take no shelf space, uh, you know, and the, people expect to pay 10 to $20 for a poster, but they don't cost much to print. They can cost up front if you have to hire a designer, but that's it. Whereas shirts, you never, you can't squeeze that margin too hard on shirts, but you can squeeze right. it pretty hard on printed materials. Well, that's that's awesome. That leads us to um, a question posted by Jake. With, uh, I mean, we didn't talk about your Kickstarter campaign too much, but we'll just say uh, he asks, you have an incredible track record with crowdfunding campaigns between Patreon, Kickstarter. Um, he says, like, what do you have a specific strategy when doing this? And then, as far as merchandise and rewards, like, how do you go in choosing, like, whether to do a poster at this amount, a T-shirt at this amount? Um, and like you said, it's a pain in the ass to <laughs> fulfill these things. Like, do you think? Because I know your Kickstarter hasn't ended yet, but uh, you have a ton of rewards and a ton of stretch goals. Do you think you feel like you? might be stretched a little thin there, or do you already have a plan in place? That's a so, lot of questions, so tackle yeah. it as you see fit. I, um, so in my case, um, I don't know how applicable my advice is in general because we're exceptional in a couple ways. Um, so first, we're, we're working with BreadPig. BreadPig is essentially a Kickstarter consultant I've worked with for years. Oh, they, they used to be like just a regular publishing house. They've kind of drifted into Kickstarter consulting, um, which, is, which is good because that's basically what we're paying them for at this point. Um, and so uh, I, other than the book plates which I'm signing and the stuff I get personally, I will probably never see any of the merchandise, um, or at least not until we're retailing it. Um, so I'm not too worried about the delivery part, especially because um, the, the guy who runs it, George Roheck, is just super detail-y, which is great. Um, we're also, Bread Pig subcontracts through a group called Amplifier, who handle shipping very well, and I know them personally, I've been to their warehouse and I know them, so I'm not, I'm not too worried about the, the technical aspects, uh, mostly because I'm not the one doing them. <laughs> um, in terms of pricing, we, uh, with the exception of one Kickstarter we did, which was the one for Starpocalypse, um, which was a different type of Kickstarter, it was to just get the project made. Um, for our other stuff, which is, in essence, glorified pre-orders, um, with, with, with audience input, that's the other cool thing, but, but glorified pre-orders with bonuses, uh, we always price to retail. The only exception to that is for the sort of ultra premium mega backer levels. We we uh, we're a little more aspirational with our pricing. Uh, but uh, but but for a regular book, you're paying within 10% of the cost one way or the other when it retails. I mean, we we don't exactly know what the final retail thing is. We can get close, but there'll be a little variance we have to account for. But you're basically shopping. Um, and so we try to keep it that way, one, because, you know, we'd like to sell the most, um, and two, because, like I was saying earlier, if you're not pricing it at retail, you're asking for a favor from your audience, and that's fine, but you can't ask for a favor, you know, we, we do Kickstarters at this point two or three times a year, and you can't ask for favors two or three times a year, you can ask for favors once every few years, maybe, you know, and um, so that helps. Um, in terms of strategy, Again, we're, it's kind of problematic for me to give advice because I have a pre-existing audience. Um, so, but for example, like the last Kickstarter I did only raised, I should say only, but just this one's doing much better. The last one raised only 50000 And I don't think we employed substantially different strategy to it. I think it was just not as sellable of an item. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit buffered because I have enough of an audience that I can make a profit every time. We made a, a nice profit on that. Not, not good compared to the amount of work it took, but, but we, we didn't lose. Um, but if you don't have that pre-existing audience, you just have a cool product, 
then it's a little trickier. Uh, I, so I don't know how applicable my advice is. I will say it, the difference between the projects, I think, that have done really well for us and the ones that have done OK is the ones that have done really well have very clear hooks on them. Um, so this last one we're, we're um, marketing, and it's true, but there, our marketing pitch is it's about it's an adventure story with a scientifically literate female protagonist, um, which I think there is a, an audience for um, that's being underserviced. Um, so, so that hook helps a lot, I think. Yeah, and I mean, and your advice does help because it tells a lot of people, like, maybe you shouldn't start a Kickstarter campaign or Indiegogo or whatever if, if you just have a cool product. Like, you might get super lucky, like um, Solar Frickin' Roadways. Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like Solar Frickin' Roseways had no audience whatsoever. Like, no one knew about it. They were in, like, what, Alaska or something? I don't even yeah. remember. But they but they just had, like, a viral hit, and the video campaign, like, said frickin' a lot, and it did and it did really well. I mean, I saw it, and I shared it on Facebook, so I was like, wow, this is actually a really cool idea. And then I thought about it, and I was like, wow, that's never going to happen. Um just because of yeah. all the logistics, but but like that, like we've been talking about, is an outlier. Like a lot of these kickstarters, like Bread Pig helped us do the Be a Puppy Cat Kickstarter too. Yeah, and they were they were amazing and did really awesome. But we needed help, and we already had a built-in audience. Yeah. Like it 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 just goes to show you, like even if you have a really awesome idea and a really like you want to get it out there maybe you should work on building the foundation of gaining an audience and having a built-in built audience that will start buying your stuff and spreading it out. Otherwise, I don't know how well it's going to do unless you have solar freaking roadways. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think it's a good point about the roadways because I, I think people try to draw this comparison between entertainment and technology, and it just doesn't work. Like, if, if some, like, completely hateable people made a like toy robot that was awesome, like they could wave a Nazi flag and you'd still buy it because you'd be like, I want the robot. Mm -hmm. But if you were selling a kid's book, forget it, you know? And and so it, it's sort of like like if J.K. Rowling write the, wrote the worst short story in the world, people would pay a million dollars for it because she's J.K. Rowling, you know, that's the way it works in entertainment, the rich get richer. Um, which is which is currently for me, so I'm I'm not opposed to it. Um, and, well I just uh, thought I would know how to play the game, right? Yeah. Exactly. You got. You should be just. Just be honest with yourself. It's just the way the system works, and it's the way it works for you when you're a consumer. You know, you don't. Uh, you have to have a level of trust when you're buying entertainment from people that maybe you don't. When, like, there's a there's a cool project a while back that was those. It was like toy submarines with a camera in them, and it did really well. But it's like, because that's awesome. You know, and all I have to believe is that you can deliver this product. I don't care what it looks like. It's a submarine with a camera in it. You know, it doesn't work in the arts, unfortunately. Did you get one? No, I missed it. Uh, yeah. But but I, I know I know a guy who works on them. So I, I I just have to see. This is the problem: is I have a kid, so I can't justify spending a thousand dollars on a camera submarine, yet. Um, even it did like I yeah yeah I should not get on this topic because I'll no talk it's about okay. It, but. We'll change topics or we'll <laughs> go back to um like did you have any strategies when it came to launching your Kickstarter? Like you're like oh this date is good or I have this many followers so right. we'll start then um, and like how yeah, about... Um, just just kind of common sensey stuff like I think we started on a Monday, Monday's a high traffic day and I think we're ending on a Tuesday so we're still getting that like like starting or ending on a Saturday is probably not a great idea. I don't know if it's a huge deal. Um, I don't know. You know, we tried to line up some media stuff, but to be honest, in, in my experience, uh, most of the media stuff you'll get organically. Like, if you happen to know someone who writes for the New York Times, you can knock on their door, but generally speaking, the, the good press we get is organic. Um, so there wasn't much we could do there. Uh, other than that, we, we just tried to have sort of a slick project. I mean, there, there's little stuff, too. Like, we're working with this great artist, Boulet, um, and we kind of we, we bugged him for as much art as we could squeeze out of him before the project, um, which I felt bad doing because he's like a capital A artist, where I'm distinctly a lowercase a artist. And uh, and but we we bugged him a lot, and we got some beautiful pieces out of him. And I think that I, I'm positive that's so because I had specifically people who said, well, I don't know about this book, but the watercolors were beautiful, so I bought it. Um, so so having some stuff to show off in advance, I think, was important. Right. Um... Shoot, I had a question. Oh, you know what? We never even mentioned what your Kickstarter is, so why don't we oh. backtrack a little bit, and why don't you tell us about the project in general? Like, what are we yeah. talking about right now? 
So I, it's a, a Kickstarter called Augie in the Green Knight. Augie is A-U-G-I-E. It's short for Augusta, um, which is sort of backhandedly the same name as my daughter. Um, and uh, uh, my wife didn't even realize the connection. It was a cute thing. But uh, So anyway, um, it's this story. It's a retelling. There's a very famous medieval romance, which if you have a literature degree like me, you probably had to read, uh, called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It's absolutely worth reading just because it's, probably the most readable and enjoyable of all medieval romances. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, but So I, anyway, the, the idea of the story is it's this sort of um, old medieval fantasy story that this modern little scientific girl gets thrown into and kind of tries to make sense of. And, uh, and so the, the basic notion of it is that it's this weird story, but the weirdness gets explained by this little girl's interaction with the fantasy environment and her trying to talk sense into the crazy Green Knight character um, from the old story. But anyway, that's what happens in it. The way we're um, pitching it, since this is talk about business, is as a, we're, we're focusing on the um, uh, having a, a strong female protagonist in an adventure story, uh, we, which is what's in the book, but, uh, but it's also, um, I think it's a, a good way to, to sell it. Uh, awesome. Do you, um, okay, so let's ask this question, another one from Jake. He's being really awesome and saying a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Jake has a lot of questions, but I know some of you out there do as well, so go ahead and just type in your questions on the sidebar there, and we will definitely get to them. Anything and everything, we will get to your questions. Don't worry about it. But Jake asks, um, how do you deal with trolls on your comics and campaigns? Like, do you deal with them at all, or you just ignore them? Uh, my general strategy with trolls is to smother them with kindness and reason. Um, it, 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 it's, it almost always works. There are some people who are really ridiculous, but um, one, most people are just screwing with you, so if you answer them honestly and kindly, they'll either usually apologize or just stop trolling. Um, some people are actually mad, and I find if you treat them nicely, they... they Oh, I swear, 90% of the time they'll relax because um, often people are angry about stupid things. Uh, don't don't say that to them, but they're often angry about like. So we had a tricky thing. This I wouldn't call a stupid thing because it's understandable that people would be upset. Um, we're charging on this project, I think, $25 to ship to France. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I say France because Boulay's from France. France is our major international order site, but um, on your we're charging $25 for international shipping. Okay. And we're doing that essentially because that is the average cost of international shipping. Um, but it sucks. Uh, it sucks to go to someone and say, the cost of you buying this book is doubled if you want the Kickstarter version because that's the cost of doing business. And it really sucks for Canadians because Kickstarter cannot tell a Canadian from a European. And oh. so Kickstarter makes us charge that $25 to everyone even though for Canadians it should be something. They, Canadians still get screwed by the way USPS works, but it should be only like screwed 7 or $10, not 25 So Canadians are essentially bearing the burden of shipping for the rest of the world. Um, but so, so we got people who are, I think, justifiably upset about that. Um, and especially we were worried because we got them posting publicly about it. Um, so George went through and, like I said, was kind and reasonable. He wrote down what everything costs, what it costs us, why we would like to charge you less for Canada, but we can't. Um, because then people have other questions like, uh, well, can you offer like a Canadian rebate or something? And we just can't do it. It, it's, it would be a crazy logistical nightmare. And so the basic deal is, and, and we told this to people, if you're from Canada uh, and you don't mind getting a slightly different version of the book, you should just wait for retail because it'll be cheaper for you. Um, so... Uh, usually you can just deal with trolls nicely. Uh, you really don't let your emotions get the better of you. You should either be nice or ignore them. There is no utility in re-trolling them. I, I, will, I will say, there, occasionally if someone's just being really asinine, you can use it as a soapbox to complain about a particular type of uh, person. Um, like I, I had a guy accusing me of being like overly... Um, I don't know, like like caring too much about money or something. And I'm like, like I, I totally appreciate that view, but I, it really bugs me personally when people accuse artists of making too much money if they're making a middle class wage. Uh, it's insane to me. It's like like nobody ever goes to the maybe they do. I don't know, but nobody ever goes to the dentist and says, "Why do you people need so much damn money for your, you know, root right. canals?" You know, and and I'm like, one, I'm just making a middle class living, and two, you can come to my house sitting to. 
it ain't coated in gold. I, I, and especially, like I said, now that I have a kid, I don't even, I don't even <laughs> I, like I'm, I've become a total horrible cheap ass like my dad. How um, old is your daughter? She is three point five months. She is a little Aww. tiny. Yeah, she's yeah. Yeah, you need you need a lot of stuff. For... I know, I know. It's hard to, <laughs> yeah. You can't even. Uh, the problem is, it's not. And, and we should not get me on the subject, but it's like you think. Well, it only costs X dollars, but it doesn't matter because now I conceive of myself as requiring infinite money, because maybe the kid wants to go to Harvard, and by the time she's eighteen, Harvard will be infinity dollars. Uh, well, my kid's gonna pay their own way through school. That's so, yeah. It's so pretty to think they got so. To study. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, well, mine's paying a little because I've done posters about kids stuff now, so I'm kind of kachinging on the kid uh, a go. little bit. <laughs> but but gotta, um, gotta anyway, so now. now and then I have responded to trolls if if it like gets me on a topic I want to talk about. It can be useful both because you feel really great about yourself and because uh, because um, it's it's probably good business too to uh, to do that. But mostly I just I. There's some certain perspectives people have that are really, really upset me, um, and I feel like I have to whine about. Um, so, but generally speaking, don't engage the trolls. Just, just be nice to them; they'll go away. And and this is the other thing: it's only like one person in a thousand who is like that. Um, you know, you can't you you get like one complaint, and you get a thousand kind words, and for whatever reason, you only hear the complaint. And so, just try to bear that in mind. It's very hard to do because viscerally. You care about the uh, outlier, the one that makes you feel bad about yourself, but uh, right. you have to try not to ignore them. Yes. Um, so back to the business side of things. Yes. Um, Andy asks, uh, describe like the business side of Saturday sure. morning breakfast cereal and how you got. I mean, we we touched on it a little bit, but I think he means specifically like the the because you put ads on it, right? Or yep. Yeah, so like how did you go apart about getting those ads on your webcomic? So um, I should say first of all, I don't consider myself a very good business person, uh, but um, I'll tell you what we sort of evolved over time. The, the initial thing that was my main source of revenue was ads, and ads are great because they're fairly low impact. You just stick them up and you get a check, which is really nice. Um, the, the only big downside to ads, other than that they're ugly typically, is that now and then they piss off your audience. Sometimes you know an ad will slip through that has a virus on it, or uh, or will make noise when it's not supposed to be making noise, and someone will get mad at you. And fair enough. Um, but generally speaking, ads it, it's really good revenue. You don't have to have a warehouse or anything. You just you just make money. Um, the downside is once again it's kind of a rich get richer thing. Um, you know um, if you have ten thousand readers, you will make more than ten times as much money as if you have one thousand readers. Um, because you can get into more boutique ad revenue um, uh, suppliers. So uh, I, I won't say who we use, but I know we used Google AdSense for a while and it was terrible. Um, I've, heard, I've heard other people have it better, but especially if you're doing something like I do, which doesn't have a niche, really, uh, you can't make that much, uh, especially off something like Google AdSense. If you happen to be like the one person doing a YouTube video about, I don't know, scuba gear, you can actually do pretty well because you'll get a lot of targeted ads. But if you're someone like me, the, the CPMs aren't so great. Um, so over time, we've tried to migrate to merch. Merch is way less seasonal, although it's still seasonal. Um, uh, but it's all, it's just more reliable income. You also you maybe you feel a little better about yourself because you've created something tangible, and that's nice. And also sometimes it's just fun. Um, we have these like we make stupid bumper stickers, which make me smile. Um, and uh, so stuff like that is nice. Uh, and so for a long time, that was our main revenue source. We introduced Kickstarter, which I sort of class separately from merchandise because it's this sort of one giant crazy drop of money once or twice a year. Um, and then recently we've gotten to Patreon, which um, is the best source of income ever because it's very low level of difficulty. And most importantly, it's not, it's not seasonal at all, unlike everything else we do. It's just a regular discernible chunk of income and it's nice be like because of that I was able to hire someone to work full time which I hadn't done in the past because it's really scary to have seasonal income uh, but if you know you're making X dollars per month you know you can pay you can meet payroll at least and that's that's very nice um, so that's what we've evolved so far I'm, I'm sure there are other good ways to do it but I, I don't know we kind of I hate to say, but I think you just have to screw up a lot. We've we've tried things and they didn't work. Tried things that didn't work, and finally we've got something that's fairly stable that seems to be working. I don't know what percent of our maximum revenue we're making, but I think we're doing okay. Awesome. Do you, um, 
Jake also asks, like, as far as Saturday morning breakfast cereal, do you have any plans of turning it into, like, a cartoon or a short film? Maybe, maybe like, something like the ASDF movies? Yeah, at some point I will probably do that. Um, cartooning is... Um, so the nice thing about comics is there's pretty much no overhead. Um, at, at this point, I, I we serve, a, like, a million comics a day, and I still... My, my fee for servers is something... It's a couple hundred a month. Um, that's pretty much all my overhead, uh, you know, art supplies, and that's minimal. Animation is expensive, uh, and I can't do it myself. I don't have the time or anything like the ability, so that would require a lot more overhead. It would probably requires to run a Kickstarter, and so I would have to really want to do it because I don't think it makes any financial sense for us. Um, I'm sure some people do really well on animations. I think the Explosion guys do very well off animations, but, I mean, there are four of them uh, to yeah. slip the work uh, over here. I, I have helpers, but in terms of the art and creative stuff, it's just me. Um, so, and as I said, I have a kid now, so I'm picking my projects a lot more carefully. Uh, I have to. Right. Animation sounds like would eat all of my time all day long, and I just. Uh, oh, that the animators listening uh, totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I know just from doing video, the amount of hours that goes into ten seconds of footage is incredible, and I just assume for animation, it's worse. Um, what, if, so, what if you had help? What if you had like an animator willing to help you out with it? Uh, uh, well, so one, I, I I don't think I have the time to write it, but but more mm -hmm. importantly, I, I don't unless it, uh, except under very rare circumstances, I just don't believe in working on equity or or um, you know not paying people for work. I would want to pay people, and I and that's not because I'm. Uh, like a generous person, it's because if you don't pay people, you have no leverage and and no professionalism typically. Um, so I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do it. I, I would want to pony up the money, which I don't want to pony up right now. No, it's really fine. Yeah. Um, let's. Uh, Jay asks, um, have you ever had an idea that you second guessed or didn't create because it was. Uh, clashing or confusing with like the brand you've created yourself, or different to what the yeah. current audience that you have. Um, that's interesting. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm, I feel like I have, but nothing springing to mind. I, I, I do think I would say this: I am more hesitant about projects that would sort of require me to explain what's going on to my audience because it's it's definitely harder. So actually, we, we were going to talk about the festival of bad ad hoc hypotheses, and so that's so I just wrote. Quick, what it is, is it's an event where people give fake lectures about evolution, like made-up evolutionary theory. Um, and so it's kind of in my wheelhouse because I do science jokes, but it's kind of not because it's events, it's live, it's human beings talking, it's not cartoons, um, it's not me doing most of the talking. In fact, at the newest one, I'm, I'm going to talk for about two minutes. I mean, I'm doing curating, but I'm not talking, and I found, unfortunately, that makes a pretty big difference uh, in terms of audience attendance, um, how much of me is involved because a lot of people, I guess, come for me. Um, and so um, it's a lot more work. Uh, we're, 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 we, we work very hard to um, you know, meet the right people to bring to this event, to try to get big names involved. It's, it's a lot more work than, for example, putting out a new SMBC book. For a new SMBC book, we just collect stuff we like, throw in some exclusives, we sell it, and we do pretty well. Um, so I, 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 have, I don't know that I've ever not done something purely because I didn't think people would like it, but what I probably do is either spend longer on it um, or I sort of softly introduce it. To, so to give an example of softly introducing, we, we just put out a, a little kid's ebook called Twins in Time, which is sort of a little kid's book in verse about the twin paradox, which is a concept in relativity, um, but which is totally kid accessible, at least in the sort of simple way we explained it. Um, and I think we'll probably end up with a little profit on that, but you know, my audience doesn't know me as a kind of person who writes books for five-year-olds, so what we're doing is we're launching that one. We have another kid's book um, coming out probably in the next month or two um, with a really cool helper on it, but I can't announce who yet. Um, so I think we're going to do this for a while, and then once it seems like people agree that we're doing a good job, we'll probably open it up as a Kickstarter or a big hardback book or something. Um, but so I, I don't think I've ever refrained from doing a, a, an idea, but I've been less, say, brazen about it. So um, you touched on the festival of Badak yes. hypothesis. Do you want to explain a little bit about what that is? How people can get involved with it? Sure. Um, so we're doing. Uh, we just let me back up. Uh, so I did a comic 
I guess it was last year, uh, about a fake imaginary event that was originally called the Festival of Ad, -ha Ad Hoc Bad Adaptationist Hypotheses, which was not even as unmellifluous as Bawfest. But uh, the idea was basically there's an event where people give bad um, adaptationist hypotheses. Adaptationist, for people who don't know, is kind of a negative term in biology that means something like a just-so story, like an overly cute explanation of um, some sort of adaptation. And so we thought it would be funny to let people just make up new ones. So like mine, for example, was that babies have evolved to be aerodynamic because primitive humans would have catapulted them. And so... Um, they need to uh, be hairless, and they need to... There's, there's a lot more to it. It's very, this is a seven-minute talk I gave, uh, so you can look it up on YouTube. Um, but, but so we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we did this as an event? Uh, and my friend Christina Shu, formerly of Bread Pig, helped put it together, and we did an event at MIT, and a 1,000 people came, Whoa, um, which was awesome. mind-blowing, because uh, I really... I feel like I was the only one surprised by this. Everyone else thought it was going to go well, but I thought like 50 people would show up. But I, I think I have a habit of underestimating um, how many people read the comic. But um, I thought a few people would show up, and then we got this venue for 1,000 people, and I was terrified. But we actually uh, sold out the amount of tickets we, we held out. So, But anyway, uh, so we just got local talent. We asked, for six, or we asked for people to submit ideas, and we got six people who, uh, by the end, and this was not our bias, this was just the best people, happened to be these super credentialed people. They were like postdocs from Harvard, and one of our guys was an MD who was local, and just all these really way smarter than me people, um, and uh, they had these really clever ideas, and then we worked with them on the sort of performance, artistic part of it, um, although most of them, you know, they're grad students, they're familiar with talking at seminars, so this was a little old hat to them. Um, uh, and so we put on this show, and it was just, it's, it's funny, I, I don't think it's a show for everyone, uh, but the people who actually went to it loved it. And so we decided we'd try to do it again. So we're doing one this year back at MIT and then another one in San Francisco, both in October. And so uh, the the way you can get involved if you're watching this is we are currently, we have submissions open. I think they're open for another month and a half or so. Um, and uh, submissions are usually a little slow coming right at the beginning. So if you want to stand out, submit early. Um, and uh, we, we have a whole form on bafest.com, that's B-A-H-Fest.com, and where you can just submit your proposal, and uh, and if you get in, you'll get to speak to hopefully a very large audience of giant nerds, um, and if, I don't know if you watched the videos, but they're nerdy enough that they will laugh at almost any nerd joke. It was the best audience I've ever performed for, um, so it's a really good time if you can get selected. And um, just to say, I'm going to, at the end of this live stream, because I post uh, on the community to all the people that missed it, stupid people, they should be here live anyway, but um, I'm going to post uh, like your Kickstarter campaign, your Patreon, um, BaFest, I'm going to post all these things so you don't have to go searching for the links, I'm just going to post them right in that community post and I'll leave it up at the top for a little bit so people can go back and watch it all over again, goodness. Um, <laughs> Cool, so that's really exciting. I'm glad that, you know, maybe it'll be like a semi-annual thing. I hope so. Yeah, that yeah. sounds awesome. It's especially because it serves, it like serves comedy to uh, it's to intellectuals, which they don't yeah. really get served. Like a lot of the comedians nowadays are like have really crass jokes, you know. Yeah. No, I totally feel the same way. I, I think it's... And it's, to the extent you get nerdy humor, it's it's either, like, not not actually really nerdy humor. Like, Tomer Ullman, who's the guy who won it, actually did a complete agent-based model um, to determine, I, I shouldn't get into it, but to prove his theory. Like, it was, you know, graduate-level work, but that audience thought it was hilarious, you know? And that's clearly not something that uh, you could get watching Dane Cook. Uh, so I feel good about that. Um... Cool. So a few people would like to know uh, uh, what are the hobbies outside of reading and drawing, at least before you had a child. Yes. Because now I'm sure your hobby is all about uh, Aug Augustine? Uh, her, her, her actual name is Ada, but it's... Uh, Ada. Ada, like the Ada Lovelace, the computer scientist. Aww. Um, but, uh, yes, uh, Ada, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the joke of the book is that Ada Lovelace, being uh, nobility, had lots of names, and one of her other names was Augusta. Um, that's what it was. Um, but my hobbies, uh, I'm, I'm rather fortunate that most of my hobbies end up for sale at some point. Um, but most <laughs> well, that's of what that's I do a is good reading. problem I, to I, have. What's that? 
It's a good problem to have. Yeah, no, it's it's awesome. The, the only downside is it's that comedy thing where you're constantly self-surveilling, which is a little stressful, but whatever. Um, I, I'm trying to think of hobbies other than changing diapers that are, like, outside of... Um, Outside of my work, I, mean, I do have, I shouldn't say too much about this, but I'm working on like a card game. Um, I'm, game design is like a hobby. I, it's, it's the job I wanted when I was 12, so we're working on a game. But I, this will actually be the game that's produced, um, so I guess that doesn't count anymore. Um, I like gardening. I, uh, oh, yeah? Botany. Yeah, I like, I like, I haven't had time to do it in a while. Um, I just, wonder my why. Life is crazy because between my work and my, my wife, um, is a biologist, um, and so we move a lot, and things are sort of nuts. So I, I, I don't. I would love to have uh, um, to do more gardening, but things are a little crazy. And now with with the kid, it's even trickier. But gardening is nice. Uh, I like pickling things, canning. I'm very domestic. Um, I'm, I'm I I I hate traveling. I, I only like traveling with my wife because then it's you know then we see things together. But I hate traveling. I'm very much. I think I could stay in my home all day, and I would just do boring. Domestic things. Uh, so sorry, I don't. I don't do any like. Uh, no, that's I don't know, fine. I don't even know what's cool. Like, uh, uh, I don't know, shark hunting or something. My wife would like to do that stuff. But I'm like, I will. I shark will. hunting? No, thank you. Biologists are crazy, though. That's the thing. Is they all want to, like, they. Uh, she's a parasitologist, and they have these stories like this guy went to Africa and he couldn't bring this animal back because it's illegal to transport diseases across borders. So he gave it to himself and just got in the plane, and I'm like, this is horrible, yeah, but, but, I, but that's how you score points as a biologist, is you get killed by things, you know? Um, and, uh, but, uh, well, I digress, but uh, no, I don't have any, I don't have, I, I mean, my main and thing in the universe is, is reading. Um, I mean, I do, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just, I was going to move on to the next topic, yeah, but it's quickly, quickly rising through the ranks. First off, it's like a two-part question. Uh, not that one. Well, we'll get back to that one later. Uh, this one, which, what kind of promos do you do before your campaigns start to let people know that they're happening, or do you just launch? Some people do that, too. And what hair conditioner do you use? That's, well, that's uh, the, one, the one that everyone wants to know. No, no doubt. Um, what kind of, well, uh, let me answer the second question first. Actually, I don't use hair conditioner. I'm just, this is sort of a natural... A natural, uh, a natural, glorious mane. Yeah, so although it, it's funny because my suspicion is, and, and I don't actually know a damn thing about cosmetics, but, like, I have my mom, like, you know, so when you shampoo your hair, you're stripping oil out of it. So we humans do this weird thing where what they do is remove oil from hair and then apply oil to hair. Uh, and I don't know, that's essentially what you're doing when you shampoo and condition. Um, and, of course, it, it does nice things to your hair, I guess, but, I don't know, stripping oil from your hair and then baking it with a hair dryer is probably... Uh, like if you explained it to aliens, they would be very confused when you were confused about what's wrong with your hair. Um, but uh, so my main inclination is a lot of cosmetic stuff that humans do is practically designed to mess up stuff that worked fine naturally. Um, but my, yeah, okay, that's hair care so products. Hair um, done. All right. Done. All right. What kind of promo campaigns? <laughs> like how? Uh, so how do, do you much. tell the um, audience? Like, what's that? I said, do you, do you tell your audience beforehand, like, hey, I'm starting a Kickstarter, or do you just go launch with it? Uh, we, we mostly just launch. I'm, hey, I'm not entirely convinced of the utility of the concept of soft launches. I don't know. I mean, I do a soft launch for a product if I don't expect it to sell super well, like, because I, I just want to sort of, like I said, with the kids' books, we're kind of trying to just get people into the idea. But soft launching a big project, I just don't see the appeal. I feel like you're taking... Uh, a little edge off your project. Like my, my theory, and I could never prove it, I don't know how you could prove it one way or the other, uh, but my suspicion is when you start a new project, the goal should be to get the most press at the same time as possible. And the, the reason is I, I suspect it's exponential. Like if you have a thousand people talking at once, it's more likely that you'll get beyond your regular audience. Um, whereas if it's just sort of a trickle to that thousand people, I don't know that it'll just, it just won't seem as big. Um, I, and I, it, one piece, arguably, of evidence for that, like, so the reason we launch books as Kickstarters when we can perfectly well handle the infrastructure ourselves is that it makes it seem like an event for our audience. We, we essentially pay the close to 10% fee of using Kickstarter because it makes it look like it's a big event. Um, and I think that's really good for our audience, but it's also good because it, it gets media clued in. And so it's like, if we launch a book and we privately earn... $50,000 in one day, nobody knows, but because you run a Kickstarter, there's this big number list. In fact, the number is completely exaggerated because it includes shipping costs. Um, 
So it's this big lie, uh, but it 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 makes for chatter. Um, so that, that I guess is one piece of advice I would say. We we try our strategy. I don't know if it works, but our strategy is to try to get the most press on day one, because um, I think it um, there's sort of a, an echo effect uh, from from big amounts of press at once. Well, I I definitely think it's working. Your Kickstarter yeah, so. thir thirty five uh, yeah, three hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, I think I think it's working pretty well. Hope so. But I mean, to to be fair though, I don't know what the counterfactual is. It could be that if I was doing a soft launch, it would make ten times more. Um, so that's my suspicion. Uh, so I can only tell you what I think. That's true. Well, I mean, I think your logic is sound. But then again, yeah. there's always like we've been talking about the theme is that there's always outliers. Like you can plan, you can say this is the rule, but then there's always people to break the rule. All yeah, the time. absolutely. Um, so let's go back to the question I accidentally deleted. I'm sorry about that, but um. So we mentioned merch and that uh, shirts do well, mm -hmm. but you don't make a lot of uh, profit off of them because the margin is so small. And then posters, maybe they don't do as well, but you can make much more off of them because they're easier to make. Is there any other merch that you sell or could recommend to people to sell besides posters and shirts? Sure, uh, yeah, uh, so it's interesting, I, I remember talking to some friends who've been in this business longer than I have, and they said, I mean, it could just be false memories, but they said, like, in the late 90s, a designer t-shirt was kind of a novelty, and so you could make an okay designer t-shirt with, like, a dinosaur on it, and you'd sell well. And now it's just a complete glut, like, you can, not only are there a ton of designer t-shirts, but there are lots of people who are just better at it than you are, you know, like, like there are sites like Threadless that are just going to outcompete you. And so I mean, we do T-shirts and we do fine, but it's it's hard. Um, so if you can come up with a novelty item, at least in, in my experience, it's really good. Like we just had this thing. Um, uh, it's a little card decal, like a little plastic stick-on, like the Darwin and Jesus fishes, and it's called Gulpo, the fish who eats concepts, and it's a giant, insane fish eating a Darwin uh, fish, which is eating a Jesus fish. Um, so I don't know what it means. It means like nihilism or something, I guess. But anyway. Uh, it made me laugh, and so it took years. We finally found out a way to source these. Um, it was fairly expensive, but they sold like crazy. Like we launched them first. We launched them as a Teespring campaign, but I think we sold we sold like 600. We we got pre-orders for like 600, 650 of them in seven days, which is really cool. Um, so it's nice because no one else can offer it, um, or if they wanted to, we'd have a big head start on them. And it's also it's just not a an item. You could buy somewhere like as a consumer, it's it's uh, unusual. We also got a little more media. Like if you put out a new T-shirt, you will not get any media about it. It's just another damn designer T-shirt. Um, but if you can come up with something that's a little weird, uh, it helps a lot. Um, so we're actually now we're looking to source these from a factory in China just because they did so well. You see, though, the downside is we're sourcing from a factory in China. It's going to be a much bigger pain in the ass than a T-shirt, which we like. We source locally, and it's very simple. Um, but so yeah, if you can come up with something weird, uh, then that helps a lot. Like try to think. Like, another thing we did, and this this worked well because it was a printed product, so it was still cheap. We figured you could you could fit all of Hamlet on a bookmark front and back, um, and those actually sold pretty well. Uh, and, and which was especially cool because had nothing to do with the comic. It was just a stupid idea, but those did fine. Um, so yeah, if you can come up with something clever, like if you can either figure out a way to reuse a pre-existing medium. Or come up with something really new. Um, like I think of Ryan North is really good at that. He's come up with like one of the rules of T-shirts, quote unquote, is that you can't have more than like five words on your shirt, or no one will buy it. He did these shirts that have like a thousand words. They're like a complete description of what's inside the shirt, or like what what you should do if you're in a time travel situation. And those killed. So basically, figure out something new, um, and and you'll do better than average. And break the rules. Yes. Yes. Well, there there are all these posters that I really like that are like entire novels written yeah. out in a, in a portrait or something and I, I love them. I think they're really awesome. Yeah, and that's, from a selfish perspective, like, that's ideal because you've come up with something awesome so you don't feel bad about yourself selling it. And then the profit margin is great and it's, it's, it's actually the perfect sort of capitalist deal which is the profit margin is good for you, the seller, because it costs you 50 cents a unit or less um, and it's good for the buyer because 10 bucks ain't so bad for a poster. Um, so it's, if you can, the hard part is the idea. You know, you, you, you know, obviously at this point it's not a new idea to do those, uh, those whole novel on a poster things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, so if you can come up with something like that, um, you can do very well for yourself. Cool. So I think um, 
questions have slowed down a little bit. I just want to remind everyone watching that if you have any other questions, go ahead and let us know. We have a few sillier questions, um, but I wanted to see if you wanted to talk about um, Starpocalypse a little bit and how that came to be. Because I know you said you did a, a Kickstarter campaign to make it. Yes. And now it's available for people to purchase. Yeah, uh, so it's available for purchase. I think it's on starpocalypse.net, but I should double check that as I speak. Um, so Starpocalypse is distinct from our other projects, where I think uh, I think of it as such because we were raising money just to make the product. Um, so it, um, I wouldn't exactly say we were asking for a favor because everyone who paid money got the, the, the project at the end, but the project was largely digital. We, we did make physical DVDs just because for some reason people still want physical goods, you know, you feel good about it. Um, or uh, you should go to starpocalypse.vhx.tv where you can download it um, for cheap. Um, but I think it's like $5 for the whole, the whole series? Yeah, I think we're charging $5 for, um, it's like a mini series and there are five episodes and it ends on a cliffhanger. Um, and, um, but so, man, video is way harder, uh, than comics, uh, and I just want to, I, I don't want to warn people against it, but, um, in terms of profit, I, I don't think it's been too much, I mean, you, you got to think about it like, one, it just costs more, uh, you know, it, a comic costs nothing to make, uh, it, it, you know, I mean, a hundred comics cost basically nothing to make, a minute of footage, especially if it's high quality, can cost thousands, and that's really cheap if you're doing it that way. Um, so to make, I think the, in the final tally, it's something like an hour of footage, and there are special effects and all sorts of stuff. So it costs a lot to make. And then if you're imagining you're going to make a profit, well, a lot of people are going to be helping you make this thing. Um, unlike, again, unlike the comic, where it's mostly you. Um, so uh, I, I don't know what the actual final breakdown is, but uh, I wouldn't take it for my day job money-wise. I mean, it was fun to make, and it's really cool to show off, like, as a look at this thing we can do, um, but it's it's much harder. So um, <laughs> so I, I suppose I, what I want to say is if you're doing a video through Kickstarter, either, you know, have a blowout somehow or do it because you love it um, because it's much harder. I mean, that's to be fair, though, that's how I feel about BoffFest. BoffFest is not profitable yet. Um, I, I hope it will be, um, and I, I think this year it'll, it'll be profitable, um, let's say, by an accountant's analysis, but not by an economic analysis that includes things like my time. Um, but, but um, you know, on video, I think you have to play the long game a lot. Because um, th th I will say this about video. The nice thing is once you can sell it, you, you're, the profit margin is 100%. You know, you're, you're, it costs you basically zero to transmit it, and you get money for that, and that's awesome, and you have the product forever. But man, it's tough. It's a way more work. Uh, and and, and I, the other thing I should add, like, I think Starpocalypse was shot. I, I was I was just kind of a producer, so I wasn't there for most of the shooting. But it was shot over like 18 shoot days, which is insane. These are like 12 to 16 hour, all day, no fun days. I mean, there's fun because it's a video shoot, but it's mostly not fun. Uh, whereas a book, like the last SNBC book, was made over like six months, very piecemeal. I won't say relaxing, but relatively speaking, quite relaxing. Uh, so, um, so if you can do a book, do a book. Um, well, you say you work uh, alone on a lot of your comic books. James just asks, like, would you recommend working with other people if you could, or do you think calling the shots yourself is a better uh, way to go? Well, it depends. So obviously money-wise it's better if you can do everything soup to nuts. Um, mm -hmm. Mind you, it, 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 that's not true if it takes you forever, or if you stink at it. <laughs> um, so like, for the children's book illustrations, Boulet is a million times better than me. Uh, and I have no problem admitting that because he's just off the wall good. Um, and so I think I personally, at the end of the day, will make more profit by working with him anyway, and we're paying him pretty well. Um, so I do recommend it, but just be judicious. You know, don't, don't do it willy-nilly. Uh, make sure you get someone reliable. Uh, the other thing is, if, if, so I'm right now talking about a specific situation in which I do all the writing and someone else does all of the art. That is very amenable to collaboration. I do not recommend getting into a situation where you have overlapping roles, especially if more than one person is the kind of person who wants to control a lot of things. It makes it very difficult. I've done it in the past, and it can work, but you you, you, you ask for trouble because people don't have the same expectations for how a project will go. So on all of my projects now, the one rule I have for collaborations is that I insist that someone be in charge, and it does not have to be me. I don't mind if it's me. Um, but someone has to be the person who can say no to everyone else. 
Um, and in addition, if you can, if there are more than one people, have your roles very defined from the get-go. Um, so one person's art, one person's promotion, one person's writing, something like that. Don't don't just say, hey, I got my best pals, it's all going to be awesome, because it won't be, because you will all have different expectations. And that's the last thing is have a conversation at the beginning where you talk about expectations, because one of you might be doing it for fun. Like, you, you know, you, you, maybe one of you is like a computer engineer who doesn't need any money and is just like, ah, this will be cool, we'll do comics. And another you is a starving artist who desperately needs $10 to make rent this month. Um, you are going to have different views about how the project should go. Uh, and it's perfectly natural. There's No one's being the evil person, but it will, it will lead to trouble. Um, so if you choose to collaborate, which there's nothing wrong with it, collaboration is often really fun, like it's been on this book. Make sure you have defined roles and expectations in advance. In fact, and I almost hate to say it, uh, but I believe it at this point, if you can do paperwork in advance, even if it's just written on a napkin, have some paperwork in advance about, like, where the money goes, what what profit means, um, who gets paid what, who's doing what amount of work. Um, it sucks because you want to you want to think it's your best friends. We're going to go into the treehouse and we're going to make a project and we'll all be happy about it. But it just doesn't work that way. Friendships can be destroyed over stuff like this too. They can, yeah. It sucks, yeah. but it's yeah. You just have to be an adult, and it, nobody likes being an adult. Yeah, friends and business partners are two totally different things. Very much, yeah. Um. So, uh, have you ever aspired to work on something that you haven't gotten the chance to work on yet? Tons. I, it's, I would say the biggest stressor in my life is I want to do other things. Uh, I especially want to do things I'm bad at. Um, I, am, I, I, I actually, before I finally made the break to doing comics full time, I was an aspiring physicist. And I had to get rid of that uh, because comic, running a comics business is tough. But now, after a long time, I have this theory I call the responsibility parabola, which is that when you have no business, you have no responsibility, um, but no money. Um, and uh, as you get more business, you actually get counterintuitively more stressed. You think you'd feel better about yourself, but it's actually more stressful because you're juggling. Um, and then my theory is that there's another side, the end of the parabolic trajectory, where you have people who help you. And it's a little obfuscated by the existence of a three-month-old, but I suspect it's by and large true that uh, now that I have a full-time helper and someone who does my accounting and does my shipping, I actually have a bit more time, so I'm trying to... I was just, before we did this interview, kind of getting back into reading um, actual physics, not pop physics, which feels really good for me. So I would love to, in 10 years, be able to uh, make some kind of contribution to physics, but I, you know... Obviously, that's a bit aspirational. Um, I would like to... I'm, I'm, my next big thing in the next couple of years is I want to write some novels. Um, I think that would be really fun. Uh, I have, a, of all my projects, the least sellable, but one which I really want to do, just much like this project, which actually turned out quite sellable, to have for my kid. I have, I'm have. i a big fan of um, medieval and Renaissance um, English verse, uh, ballad-style poetry, and I, so I was writing this really long one about uh, another little girl adventure, um, which I think would be really cool because, you know, people write verse and they write stories, but no one that I know of in a long time has written, like, a good, like, you know, 400 canto long uh, song that you could sing to your kid uh, from a book. Uh, so I, 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 I've written the first book of it, and I don't know when I'll get to the rest of it. But So I have a lot of stupid ideas I want to do. Um, I'm, I'm privileged in that comics are good enough, and at this point it, I'm... I'm I flatter myself that I'm good enough at it, that it's kind of like a place from which I can launch all the other stuff I wanted to do when I was 10. Um, so, yes, too many aspirations. I should cut some out, but I haven't managed um, to do it yet. But none of them are to go back into the entertainment business. Anyway. No, no. Entertainment, uh, I know nice people who work in entertainment, but they are exceptional. Um, entertainment as a business has a tendency to crush out people who are not... Uh, political sociopaths, and um, and so I mean it, de it depends. When I, I should say when I say entertainment, I am talking in specific about the Los Angeles entertainment business as I experienced it. That is to say, the the um, big money uh, aspect of Hollywood entertainment. It's just vicious and mean and uh, mm -hmm. nasty. And although there are nice people who work in it, it's let me say it this way: if in 20 years my daughter wants to work in entertainment. I will not say no to any career, but I would at least have a talk with her about that one. And the only other career I would say that about is maybe boxing. So that's how that's how I feel about entertainment, you know. Um, oh. 
getting punched in the face for a living. It's just not. No, I, no. You know, I've said to my wife about this. We kind of disagree about this because I'm like, I'm all for having a strong little girl, but I would say the same thing to a boy. A job where you get punched in the brain, uh, I will not support. I don't care how awesome it is. No football, no boxing. I don't care how stodgy you think I am. <laughs> you can, you can, you can play swimming or something, something boring. Um, but yeah, but so that's what when I say I'm serious about it, that is how much reservation I would have about entertainment. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're winding down now. Is there any topic that we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about, touch on, anything like that? Uh, let's see. Let me, am I doing anything else? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. It was pretty extensive. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think I have anything else cool. Well, I think we have plenty cool going on. Let's just do one, uh, a few more shout outs to all of the crazy pro uh, projects that you have going on, especially because your Kickstarter is still going and people can still donate. So why don't you go ahead and pitch like yes. what you have going on. Um, a perfect yes. time. Uh, the, the big project we have now is Augie and the Green Knight. It is a children's adventure book in the style of T.H. White or Lewis Carroll featuring a young female protagonist who is scientifically literate, intelligent, unapologetic about it, and crucially is someone who likes taking risks and getting into trouble and being embarrassed, and that's all fine. Um, so I think it's open for the next 20 hours, uh, and I say this at about 2 o'clock. <laughs> um, uh, and so please give it a look. Awesome. Um, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I really hope that uh, people have learned a lot of stuff. I know I've learned a thing or two and you've confirmed some of my suspicions and we've proven that there are outliers to everything we've talked about um, so there really is no hard and fast rule. But um, I'm just gonna say again thank you very much for talking with us and to all of the people in the network out there right now thank you for watching. This will be available on our Channel Fred Network YouTube channel. Um, which is our business facing, which has all of our other live streams in it. Like I said, I'm going to repost it into the community as soon as it goes live, along with um, the Kickstarter link, the link to his Saturday morning breakfast cereal, web comics, um, his Patreon, BaFest, which is going to be really awesome, um, Star Apocalypse, I'll also throw that in there. Is there anything else that you'd like to shout out? Uh, Jake asks if you have any other web comics that you're huge fans of. Or oh, anything. that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, yeah. Like I don't read too many comics. I mostly read my friends' comics. Um, uh, Oglaf is pretty great, uh, but that's not appropriate for work. So. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Again, it was amazing having you. Uh, really appreciate it. I just, you know, if you want to get more successful with your ad revenue on YouTube, you can totally hit up us up and uh yeah cool um, thanks yeah it's been a pleasure awesome thanks and good luck with your little daughter <laughs> thanks thanks so far so good she's uh, remarkably well behaved three months in right 3.6 3. or so yeah yeah a whole lifetime to go yep <laughs> sure. yeah it's weird well good luck with that and i hope you have a great day i'll definitely keep in touch you too yeah thanks <laughs>